Hey, this beef is too salty. No way, mother-in-law. You made it. Oh dear, silly me. My name is Sarah, 28. I work as a nurse. And by the way, the one cheerfully serving the stew right now isn't my mom, but my mother-in-law, Andrew's mother. Ever since we got married, she's been very affectionate towards me, and even without Andrew, I would visit my in-law's place to cook and eat meals together. I, who don't have a good relationship with my own parents, am closer to my mother-in-law than my own mother. My mother-in-law is a cheerful character, and she raised Andrew and his brother single-handedly after a divorce when Andrew was still a kid. I remember being quite nervous when I first met her, because a married friend once told me, In-laws are people you can never understand in your lifetime. But those fears vanished as soon as I met my mother-in-law. I've always wanted a daughter. We only had rough boys in our house. Thanks for marrying Andrew. She said warmly, gripping my hand. I felt from the bottom of my heart that I would get along with this person. After getting married, she said, I want our relationship to be like friends. So let's avoid formal language from now on. Of course, I was resistant at first. But now we can joke and tease each other. Lately, we have been playing pranks, pretending to be a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law with a bad relationship. People are often surprised to learn that we are in-laws. I still use polite language when there are many people gathered, such as for rituals. So, Andrew is working again today? Yeah, it's shift work, so I thought there would be almost no overtime, but he seems to be busy because of a shortage of staff. Hmm, well, I'm happier to see you, Sarah, than Andrew, so I'm having fun just cooking with you. She said such a happy thing. While we were chatting, my cell phone rang. Well, speak of the devil, hello. The caller was my husband, Andrew. He had said he would stop by his parents' house after work, and we would all have dinner together. Oh, Sarah, it's me. Sorry, I can't seem to get away from work, so I don't think I can make it. Again? You did that last time, too. Your mother has been waiting and cooking for you. Well, it's work, so I can't help it. And she's happier to see you than me, so I'll ask you to take care of her. With that, he hung up the phone, unilaterally. It's been like this lately. <sighs> Mother-in-law, Andrew just told me that he can't make it again today. Oh, really? He completely neglects his family, just like my divorced ex. As we were fussing over it, a voice came. Could you keep it down? I can hear you outside. The one who spoke was Andrew's younger brother, whom we'll call Tom. Tom, who's still single, lives with his mother in their family home. Oh, sorry. Welcome home, Tom. I greet him, but he always just nods his head and heads straight to his room. He's such a cool guy, as usual. My mother-in-law often worries whether he's got someone special or not. Andrew and Tom may look alike, but unlike my sociable husband, Tom is rather quiet. Their brotherly relationship is neither too good nor too bad. I often hear about many people who are troubled by their difficult relationships with their in-laws, but I never had such worries. Sure, there were some concerns, but I was living a pretty happy life. Little did I know that I was about to get caught up in something. It was one day while I was at work. That day was the hottest day of the year. Typically on such days, we get a lot of heat stroke victims incoming. Seeing the patient who was brought in, I was shocked. It's my mother-in-law. The one accompanying my unconscious mother-in-law was Tom. And it seems she had collapsed in the yard when he got home. Gardening is a hobby of my mother-in-law's, and the yard is always filled with plants. 
The types of plants change with the seasons, and on nice days, one of her pleasures is to go out in the yard and have some tea. She was so absorbed in gardening, and it seems that she just collapsed from heat stroke. Tom looked worriedly at his mother. Please help my mom, I beg you. Seeing Tom's tearful face, I realized just how much he cherished his mother. As I told him that everything would be okay, I asked him, Have you told Andrew about this? Tom responded, I tried calling him several times, but he never answers. Is Andrew working today? Andrew should be off today. When I left for work, he was still sound asleep. No, he's off today. He might still be asleep. I'll contact him. Tom, could you handle mother-in-law's hospital admission procedures? Of course. Thank you very much. Fortunately, my mother-in-law just had mild dehydration. After some intravenous fluids, she regained consciousness and was even able to hold a conversation. Despite assuring us she was fine, she ended up being hospitalized for a few days for further examination. I guess I pushed myself too hard and suddenly felt weak. I'm sorry for worrying you. Thanks, Tom. As she said this to Tom, he replied as always, Not a big deal. Keeping his cool demeanor. At this point, I finally remembered to call Andrew. After trying several times without response, a groggy voice on the other end of the line finally answered. Hello? Ah, oh, Andrew, you finally answered. How long are you planning on sleeping? In response to me, Andrew replied lazily. Actually, I've been up and out for a while now. You know I haven't seen Mom in a while, right? Thought I should do something nice for her, so I took her out to a fancy restaurant. Hearing Andrew speak such blatant lies, I realized the truth. I see. She must be happy. Yeah, she seemed really happy. She's so attached. It's almost troublesome. Anyway, because of that. As he was about to hang up, I said, Wait, there's something I wanted to ask mother-in-law. Can you put her on the line? Seeing how he seemed to panic at my request, he managed to croak out. Uh, no, she just went to the bathroom. I'll just pass on the message. That's okay. I'll just ask her myself the next time I see her. Are you coming home early today? Sorry, but I have to work after this. Tom tried calling me earlier too, but I figured it wasn't anything urgent, so I just ignored it. <laughs> He said as he laughed before abruptly ending the call. I had suspected it for a while, but it became clear that Andrew was having an affair, and it seemed like he was deeply infatuated with his mistress. I could almost imagine flowers blossoming in his mind. I wonder which field of flowers he's lost in. I won't let him get away with this. He better be ready. From that day on, I began plotting my revenge. The day I was certain of Andrew's betrayal, I packed my belongings and left our home. I left my wedding ring in a note that simply read, Be ready, on the desk. I rented a hotel room near my workplace and started commuting from there. I've always been one to have little material desire. I had a few possessions, and being a nurse, my salary was pretty decent. On my days off, I would often visit my in-laws, so I didn't spend much money. Ever since I got married, I haven't been able to save much for certain reasons. Though the idea of my money dwindling did worry me, I was planning on having Andrew pay back what was lost. Andrew got in touch with me the day after I left the house which means he must have gotten home in the morning. He clearly doesn't take me seriously. I got multiple calls, but I ignored them all. When he realized I wasn't going to pick up, he started bombarding me with messages. At first, they read like, Sarah, you must have misunderstood something. I'm worried. 
Please come home. It was my fault. But over time, they became more aggressive. Hey, respond to me. If you want a divorce, go ahead. You're the one who mentioned divorce, so I expect alimony. And then he would apologize again. Is he emotionally unstable or something? Reading his messages, I could tell he was getting desperate, so I decided it was time to take action. The following week, I visited the in-laws. Since that day, my mother-in-law had her test, but no issues were found, so she was discharged as planned. That day, we had all gathered to celebrate her discharge. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing this wonderful gathering. I bought your favorite cake from the bakery you love, so let's eat it together later. When I told her that, she smiled joyfully. So, how are things with that matter? Mother-in-law asks, so. All the preparations are complete. I can't wait. When I said that, I grinned. As I was having a pleasant dinner with my mother-in-law, the doorbell rang. Seeing the person on the intercom screen... Her face turned serious instantly. Seeing her reaction, I immediately knew who it was. Come in! When my mother-in-law said so coldly, the front door opened and the person I'd been waiting for that day entered. Long time no see. It was Andrew, whom I had invited, insisting he come because we needed to talk. Of course, I had already told my mother-in-law everything. Upon hearing about Andrew's infidelity from me, she was furious. But when I said that I'd like her to wait a bit, given that this is a marital issue, she just apologized over and over about her son. Seeing her like this made me feel guilty instead. Sarah, why didn't you contact me? I've been worried all this time. It's fine. It's fine. Cut the drama. I think you know. But divorce is the only option. Of course, I'll be taking alimony. Once the topic of money came up, my so far mature husband reacted. What? Why do I have to pay the alimony? Sarah should be the one to pay. Enough about money, money, money. I wondered if his head was all right, but I thought I shouldn't get emotional to keep the conversation going. I calmly replied, Well, you see, you're the one who cheated. You're obviously the one at fault. And you're obviously the one who should pay the alimony. But still, seeing my husband mutter inaudibly, my until now silent mother-in-law finally lost her patience. Andrew, you've been spouting nonsense. Just hurry up and get a divorce and pay the alimony to Sarah. And don't ever come here again. If you do, I'll bury you in the garden. As my mother-in-law was about to say something outrageous, I stepped in to stop her. Stop, stop. Andrew, aren't you ashamed to put your parents through this? Here, sign this right now. Saying this, I placed the divorce papers I had prepared in front of Andrew. He looked shocked. Perhaps he hadn't expected the talk of divorce. I was surprised that he thought he would be forgiven in this situation. Why did you come alone today? Didn't I ask you to bring her along? When I glared at him, he said, Seriously, I did talk to her, and she seemed willing, so I brought her along. She's waiting in the car right now. I was irritated by my husband's mumbling, so I snapped. Just go get her! Understanding, he left and returned with a woman. Excuse us. A woman entered with a grating voice. Seeing a woman show up with such energy at her affair partner's family home and in front of his wife and mother, no less, I thought she was as usual. Hi there, mother-in-law. Nice to meet you. I'm Michelle. And long time no see, Sarah. <laughs> Seeing me, she chuckled. You're as usual, Michelle. I'm surprised you haven't changed at all. This wasn't a compliment, 
I was talking about her personality, not her appearance. She looked like a proper woman in her 30s. But her clothes and makeup made her look like a high school girl. It didn't suit her at all. Really? That's so nice. Maybe it's because I go to a good beauty salon. As for you, Sarah, have you aged a bit? <laughs> she looked at me, then chuckled through her nose. Andrew, my husband, had a surprised look on his face when he saw Michelle and me. Uh, you two know each other? Yeah, we were classmates in high school. Haven't seen each other since we graduated. But who would have thought we'd meet again like this? When I answered, Andrew for some reason seemed relieved and said something outrageous. Oh, come on. You could have said that sooner. If she's your friend, there's no alimony, right? That's good news. My Princess Michelle seems like I won't have to pay a dime. His ridiculously foolish statement left me utterly dumbfounded. No, we're not friends. And did he just call her Princess? Gross! This reminded me of when Andrew and I first started dating, when he used to call me my Princess Sarah. It became so annoying that I had to make him stop. His nickname game is the worst. So gross. When I discovered Andrew's infidelity, I immediately sought a lawyer. As the investigation proceeded, I found out that the woman he was cheating with was Michelle. This woman has always been like this, seeming to fancy other women's men, constantly hitting on guys even if they already had girlfriends, often causing arguments. And it's not even like she's pretty. To be honest, her looks are below average. However, she's brimming with confidence and probably thinks she's the prettiest woman in the room. I'm not really into social media and don't know much about it. According to a friend, Michelle would send messages without hesitation to any man she finds attractive. It appears that she met Andrew through social media. Michelle's job is basically a housemaid. I felt pathetic that my husband's mistress turned out to be a woman like her. I get tired of talking to you two. Can you sign this quickly? When I said that, Andrew, who was hesitant about the divorce until now, readily signed the divorce papers. Apparently, he genuinely believes there's no alimony. Now I can finally be with Andrew. I'll always be your pretty wife. Nothing is more cringeworthy than a woman in her 30s trying to act all cutesy. Despite this, Andrew didn't seem to mind. I started to worry about his eyesight. So, mother-in-law, please get along with me from now on. When Michelle says this, my mother-in-law replied, Huh? No thanks. She answered with a deep, intimidating voice. Oh no, that's scary. As Michelle started to whine to my husband, Andrew, he started spouting nonsense about being unfair even though she's good friends with me. I was thinking someone ought to do something about these two when my brother-in-law, Tom, came home. Seeing the chaotic scene, he managed a wry smile, seemingly understanding the gist of the situation. Then Michelle suddenly exclaimed, Wait! Isn't that Tom? No way! Are you the brother he mentioned? She seemed to be getting overly excited all by herself. As I wondered what had come over her, Tom responded, Long time no see, Michelle. Apparently, Michelle and Tom used to work at the same part-time job. Considering Tom's not bad-looking, it's not surprising that Michelle had taken a liking to him. By the way, due to her terrible memory, Michelle ended up getting fired from that job. Ha <laughs> I'm going to be your new sister-in-law. Are you happy? Michelle swayed her body as she addressed Tom, to which he responded, Are you serious? That's the worst. My brother-in-law replied coldly. His cold response seemed to stun Michelle, 
who froze in place. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, this was sent to me by a friend. That's you, right? Tom then showed us a certain website. It was one of those unpleasant sites where people laugh at other people's social media posts. One person was frequently the butt of jokes on this site, with comments like, Michelle is exhausting today, too. And, At this point, it's just a joke. Furthermore, Tom showed us one of Michelle's social media accounts. The photos were mostly selfies, making it obvious that they were of Michelle. Looking at Michelle out of the corner of my eye, thinking that this would surely upset her, she said, It's hard being popular. These are mostly just women being jealous. Oh well, whatever. Although she responded in that manner, it was clear she was less energetic than before. Even she seemed to have been hurt by this. Just because it's the internet doesn't mean you can write whatever you want. I couldn't help but feel a bit of sympathy for her in this case. Well, it doesn't matter. From now on, Andrew and I are going to live a glamorous life. Hearing those words, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. <laughs> a glamorous life? No way. Could you stop acting tough because your husband got taken? It must be tough to lose a doctor husband, huh? <laughs> At Michelle's words, we all burst into laughter. Wait, when did Andrew become a doctor? Congratulations! I was laughing so hard that Michelle looked utterly bewildered. Apparently, my husband had posted a picture of the hospital where I work on social media, along with the words, Another hardworking day. I remember he used to come pick me up after work. The post was meant for me. But she somehow misinterpreted it as Andrew's workplace. The equation of hospital equals doctor made me burst into laughter due to its simplistic nature. <laughs> but Andrew was always generous with money and even took me to a fancy restaurant the other day. He also paid for my spa appointments. As Michelle continued, it was clear she was starting to panic. I didn't think my husband had much money, which was puzzling. When I asked him about the source of the money, he let out an astonishing revelation. I used Sarah's credit card. Even if we're family, using a credit card in someone else's name is illegal. But my main card is still in my wallet. I used it to pay for a hotel just the other day. So whose card did he use? As I was wondering this, he returned the card. Well, what's done is done. Besides, we're still married. Look, this is a family card. It's your card. He must have forgotten, but we got this family card when we got married, because there was a campaign to increase points. I have my own card, so I've never used it. Therefore, of course, the payment this time was from his account. You still have your severance pay from your previous job, right? You'll figure it out. As I said this with a smile, his face turned pale. He used to work for a fairly decent company. His diligent work was valued, and he even became a team leader. However, after being married for a while, he suddenly quit his job. He claimed the reason was me. As a nurse, I often worked night shifts and sometimes earned more than him. This apparently hurt his pride, and he started saying things like, If Sarah's making money, I don't have to work, right? But I didn't mind that at all. My husband Andrew did help out with the chores around the house, which was beneficial. However, it was indeed tough having to bear the cost of living all by myself. Almost all my salary went towards living expenses, and I had no room to save. Andrew always made up some excuse to avoid visiting my in-law's house, probably because he didn't want my mother-in-law nagging about this issue. I was naive to think that he would someday find a steady job. Desiring some pocket money, Andrew announced, I got a job. 
he started working part-time at a convenience store near the train station and has been promoted to team leader. Listening to my story, Michelle muttered, Convenience store? Team leader? She was mumbling something under her breath, then suddenly stood up, exclaiming, You've been lying to me! You're the worst! I'm going to sue you! I'm leaving! She ran off like a scared rabbit. Watching her retreating figure, I thought to myself, It's you who's going to get sued, sorry to say. I muttered so in my mind. After the storm passed, the room was eerily silent. Breaking the silence was, Well, that's how it is. Sarah, let's get along from now on. It was my silly husband, Andrew. I was dumbfounded at his stupidity. When Andrew tried to put his arm around me, my former judo team captain, brother-in-law Tom, performed a beautiful throw on him. When I saw my mother-in-law exclaiming, What a throw! I had to stifle my laughter. Andrew apparently had some judo experience, but he looked quite foolish, taken by surprise. As for what happened after, I quickly filed for divorce. Andrew paid me alimony from a term deposit that had matured before we got married. He showed up at my workplace once after the divorce in a pitiful manner, but after I threatened to call the police if he showed up again, he never did. I thought about claiming damages from Michelle as well, but honestly, I didn't want to deal with her anymore. I didn't need to do anything. I knew she would face hardship in the future. During a consultation with a lawyer, I learned something about Michelle. About the woman your husband cheated with? We'd received consultations from other people as well, and I believe she will definitely be punished. Apparently, Michelle was involved with many people, not just my husband, and there were over ten victims, including people whose marriages had been ruined or who had lent her money and been run out on. She definitely needs to pay for her actions. A few days later, a friend from high school showed me a viral video on social media where victims were gathered in front of Michelle's house shouting, Give back our money! And, We'll never forgive you! It became such a scene that the police had to be called in. And there in her home, Michelle was shouting from her window, I did nothing wrong. What surprised me was that my ex-husband, Andrew, was among the crowd of victims. I felt truly relieved to have divorced such a foolish man. As for my former in-laws, I thought I wouldn't see my former mother-in-law after the divorce, but we still occasionally go out to eat as friends. Surprisingly, a while after all this, my former brother-in-law, Tom, said, I'm getting married. He even introduced me to his cute girlfriend. Apparently, they've been dating since high school. He transferred to a reputable company. And as my former brother-in-law, he even kindly invited me to his wedding. I couldn't believe that this diligent Tom was a brother to my former husband. I believe that Tom, being so earnest, will surely build a good family. With that thought, I decided to continue doing my best as a proud nurse. I'm giving our house to my brother's family. If you refuse, we're getting divorced. Get out right away. My husband's brother, Kevin, retired. Kevin is now living on his pension and seeing how wasteful it is to pay rent. My husband, Jack, suddenly decided to give our house to Kevin. Kevin's wife, Linda, whom Jack agreed with, also threw some nasty insults at me. What are these two even saying? But I'm the one who inherited this house. I replied, and Jack looked surprised, saying, Huh? Had he forgotten? Having reached my limit with him, I decided to kick Jack out. My name is Catherine Hope. I'm 45 years old. I've been married to my husband Jack for over 20 years. We've not been blessed with children, and since we did not seek infertility treatment, it's just the two of us. Jack was my boss when I was still working, 
and he was a very reliable person. Ever since my parents died in an accident when I was very young, I've lived with my grandparents. My grandfather was a strict but loving person and my grandmother was always gentle and supportive to me. I've been able to live this far thanks to their support and love. When I became an adult and started working, it was my turn to take good care of my grandparents. I gave them trips as presents, took them out for meals. We had such a great time. Then suddenly, my grandmother was hospitalized. She was diagnosed with lung cancer and passed away. I mourned and grieved with my grandfather. And although I wished for my grandfather to live as long as possible, the following year, he had a stroke and passed away as if following my grandmother. One misfortune after another. My heart was in tatters. During this time, the one who cared for me the most was Jack. He encouraged me, inviting me to dinner when he saw me looking downcast at work. I became attracted to Jack, and we got engaged. Then began our married life. I quit my job because Jack wanted me to, and became a housewife. After getting married, Jack became a dominant husband. This influence came from his older brother, Kevin, who was much older. Kevin's wife, Linda, was very dedicated to him. Jack seemed to admire this and wanted me to act like Linda. I did not question Jack's intentions. Kevin was a respectable and sensible man, never forgetting to show his gratitude to his wife. In fact, I supported him earnestly, hoping that Jack could become that way too. From the outside, Linda seemed to be a good wife who supported Kevin tirelessly. However, I did not have a good impression of her, because Linda saw me as a rival and behaved in a way to provoke mistakes from me. Jack, being trapped by Linda's manipulation, started making remarks comparing me and Linda. That was something I couldn't stand. Despite everything, I've always tried to be as selfless and dedicated just as Jack wished for. Jack, however, often compared me to Linda without understanding how I felt. Each time he did that, I was filled with an empty feeling. Today was no different. Jack came home a bit earlier from work than usual. I was surprised as I hadn't received any communication about him returning early. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't expect you to be home this early. Dinner isn't ready yet. When I said this, Jack let out a deep sigh, glanced at me sideways and handed over his jacket. Oh, you really need to take a page out of your sister-in-law's book. You're so inconsiderate. He tossed these words at me and then went into the living room. He turned on the TV and sat heavily on the couch. I rushed to bring him a beer and some snacks. If he was going to come home early, he could have let me know. I felt dissatisfied, but I knew I would face harsh words from him if I voiced these thoughts. Jack sat silently drinking his beer and eating snacks while watching TV. He has never thanked me. He acts as if it's my duty to serve him in this way. Before we were married, he was my boss, and he wouldn't hesitate to scold me if I made any mistakes. Yet, he would never admit his own. He's proud and always wants to impress his brother. It might seem like he's not a nice person when I talk about him this way, but he does have a kind side. I knew this aspect of him, so I lived as he wished. Today, Jack came home late. When I greeted him with, Welcome home, after 9 o'clock, he silently left his clothes scattered and went straight to the bathroom. He must be really tired from working overtime. Thinking so, I prepared dinner so he could eat as soon as he got out of the shower. Jack sat down at the table silently, and the moment I set his fork down, he started eating. You're quite late today, huh? You must be tired. Busy day? Even when I addressed him like this, he gave no response. After finishing his meal in roughly 10 minutes, Jack had his evening drink and went straight to the bedroom. He didn't respond to anything I said during that time. After making sure Jack went to the bedroom, I sighed and started cleaning up the dishes. Once that was done, I also had to prepare a full suit for his work tomorrow. After checking everything, I went to take a bath, and then headed to the bedroom. Jack was already asleep, and I carefully went to bed without waking him. Recently, Jack has had many days like this. 
Not only does he not listen to what I say, but he also doesn't respond to anything. If I persistently ask for a response, he will invariably say, shut up, and become grumpy. It's very troublesome when he's in a bad mood and doesn't get over it. And I feel suffocated even though I'm at home. But I couldn't dislike him. On his good days, we would have silly conversations just like old times, and we would eat the desserts he bought us together. So on days like this, I told myself that he must be in a bad mood or perhaps one of his subordinates made a mistake. We've been married for more than 20 years now, so maybe this is just the right amount of distance between us. But is it selfish of me to wish for those fun times every day? One day, out of the blue, I received a call from my brother-in-law. It was odd, as he usually calls my husband directly. I wondered what was up. Though curious, I immediately handed the house phone to my husband. Hello? What's going on, bro? My husband said, speaking in a lighter tone than usual, and started a pleasant conversation with his brother. During such moments, my husband becomes quite childlike. It's clear how much he looks up to his brother. To avoid interrupting my husband's phone call, I quietly resumed my housework. After my husband finished the call, I went to take the phone back from him. What's going on with your brother? Even though I asked, my husband just responded with a, Yeah... I figured it wasn't anything serious, so I thought and didn't press further. I just went to put the phone back in its place. A few days later, I noticed my husband was sneakily preparing something. I was curious about what he was doing, but hesitated to interrupt him, so I went on with my usual routine. As I was doing housework and casually observing my husband's activities, I noticed him carrying loads of things from the room to the backyard sorting out what he needed and didn't need. What kind of mindset caused him to suddenly start cleaning, I thought as I finished my chores and took a little break. Then, my husband suddenly stood in front of me. What are you doing? Get ready already. You see me bustling around, right? Why aren't you doing anything? Huh? I looked at my husband in surprise. Seeing my reaction, he heaved a big sigh and started to say, Oh. <sighs> This is exactly why you're hopeless. I think I must have looked dumbfounded at my husband's grumbling. What are you so angry about? You really don't get it. Honestly, I always tell you to take a leaf out of your sister-in-law's book. I shouldn't have to explain everything from scratch. But if you don't tell me what you're doing, I can't do anything. Gosh, we talked about this, right? We're moving. I was taken aback by my husband's sudden statement. I had no recollection of such a conversation. Seeing my puzzled face, my husband started to explain in an exasperated tone. Remember the call from my bro? He's retired. He's going to live on his pension now, which seems tough. He was saying that it feels like a waste to pay rent for his house, so we're going to give him ours. That way, he won't have to pay any rent, right? How can you not get that? I was dumbfounded by my husband's selfishness. Normally, that's something we discuss together but my husband went ahead and made this decision all by himself. I never agreed to this. Why do I have to give up our home? I retorted in a flustered manner, to which my husband barked, Quiet! No, no, I can't accept this. I don't want to give up our house. And besides, your brother and his wife, they wouldn't want this either, would they? While we were having this heated argument, the doorbell rang. My husband motioned towards the front door, urging me to answer it. Frustrated, I ran to the front door, putting the conversation on hold for a moment. Opening the door, I was greeted by my brother-in-law and his wife. When I invited them into the living room, my husband walked towards them with a smile on his face, and then he started to tell them that unbelievable story. My brother-in-law seemed reluctant about my husband's proposal, but Linda seemed quite eager. Are you serious? I can't accept this. I objected in panic but my husband shot me a menacing glare. Overpowered by his gaze, I fell silent. Then my husband finally said something outrageous. I'll give our house to my brother. If you don't agree, we're getting divorced. Linda, with a nasty grin on her face, raised her voice as well. Yeah, you should leave already. I was annoyed by their attitudes, and instead of voicing my dissatisfaction, I glared at them. 
Then Linda got confrontational, saying, What's with that look? You're the wife, you should pay your husband, right? We're family. I think we should make decisions about family matters together. I heard this news today, so I'm just saying that I don't agree with it. Upon hearing my words, my husband gave me a cold stare. Why do I have to receive such a look? I was dissatisfied with my husband. We're family, right? Just because I'm your wife doesn't mean I have to agree with everything, right? I asked my husband, seeking reassurance. I thought he would of course be understanding. However, he harshly responded, Even though you're my family, you're still my wife. You need to obey me. Upon hearing this, something inside me snapped. I've heard enough of what you have to say, so let's get divorced. At my words, my husband and my brother-in-law's family gave me a surprised look. You said it yourself, didn't you? If I don't obey, we'll get divorced. I won't obey you. So let's get divorced. My husband stared at me with wide, terrified eyes, but I didn't flinch. I'll get the divorce papers. In the meantime, you can pack your belongings or do whatever you need to do. With that, I stormed towards the front door, got into the car, and drove off. I didn't care anymore. After all that I had done for him, my husband sided with Linda instead of me. It makes me sad to think about it. He can do as he pleases. Tears were streaming down my face as I was driving. A few minutes later, I arrived home. There were a lot of boxes ready inside the house, and my husband approached me. All that's left is your stuff. Pack everything up. All the kitchenware and appliances you've been using, you do it all by yourself. My husband said. I handed him the divorce papers filled out, in response to him. He took them and began to sign with a pen that was nearby. Then, with a smug look on his face, he shoved the divorce papers back at me. Now we're strangers, so when are you planning to move out? I don't need to leave since we're strangers now. But you should hurry up and go. My husband was dumbfounded at my words and stared at me. But what are you talking about? We just talked about this. You're leaving too, he said as he raised his voice. Hearing his words, my brother-in-law and his wife rushed over. Looking at everyone's faces, I returned the question. What are you talking about? I'm the one who inherited the house. At those words, my husband was letting out a dumbfounded, Huh? This is my grandparents' house. You said you wanted to live in this house that I inherited because you thought paying rent was a waste. When I said that, my husband came up to me in clear confusion and said, What do you mean? I'm your husband, you're my wife. So I automatically inherited, don't I? What kind of nonsense are you talking about? You have no relation to my grandparents. Inheritance is something that's passed on to those who are related. Since we have no children, my inheritance is mine. I never imagined that my husband didn't understand the mechanism of inheritance. I was dumbfounded at my husband's lack of common sense. When I told you about the inheritance, you didn't pay a dime for the property tax of the house and land because it was in my name. Don't you remember? When I said that, my husband was flustered and at a loss for words. The one who raised her voice instead of my husband was Linda. It's your fault for not explaining properly. A wife should support her husband, trying to kick him out in such a deceitful way. What kind of person are you? Whatever she says, the fact that it is in my name doesn't change. How do you propose to hand it over when the name is different? That's why I said let's have a proper discussion, but Jack never listened. I said as I glared at Linda, This is going to turn into a big fight, and I could be hit, but that's okay. I disciplined my timid feelings and made up my mind. In the midst of that, my brother-in-law, who had been listening to our conversation, suddenly raised his voice. Jack, Linda, stop it. Don't cause any more trouble. At the sound of my brother-in-law's loud voice, the two of them jerked their shoulders in surprise. I was also surprised by the two of them and stiffened my body. After glaring at my husband and Linda, my brother-in-law took a step forward. Catherine, I apologize for my brother and my wife being so selfish. With those words, my brother-in-law hugged me. Seeing such a gesture from him, Linda exclaimed, Stop it! and sprang forward. Why are you apologizing? Jack said he would give us the house, so Catherine, his wife, should follow that. There's no need for you to apologize. Stop it. How disgraceful. Why would you take this house away from Catherine? That's not right, is it? This house is in Catherine's name. 
Catherine has the right to make decisions here. If anything, Jack should be the one listening to Catherine. With those stern words, my brother-in-law gave a sharp look at my husband. My husband, startled, was lost for words. Threatening with divorce without even discussing it properly as a couple? I'm ashamed to have a brother like you. Who do you think you are? With my brother-in-law's words, my husband started to make excuses. But, but, but you, big brother, you always impose your ideas on Linda. I believe that's how a husband should behave. That's why I've been tough on my wife. What are you talking about? Yes, I may spoil Linda at times, but I've never decided important matters by myself or pressured Linda to obey me. In fact, I always appreciate my wife for standing by me. Having been reprimanded by my brother-in-law, my husband finally seemed to realize his mistake, hanging his head in shame with a pale face. Then he cautiously turned his gaze towards me. Oh, about the divorce, could we put it on hold and have a calm discussion? I gave my husband a cold stare at his words. A calm discussion? What are you talking about? We've already decided, haven't we? We're getting a divorce. You're leaving, and I'm staying here. What more is there to discuss when it's already been decided? All I want to know is when you're leaving. At my words, my husband seemed stunned. My brother-in-law shook his head, looking exasperated. Linda, beside him, trembled with a pale face. After my brother-in-law and his wife left, I filed for divorce thereby dissolving my marriage. Despite that, my husband continued to cling to the house, but I never changed my mind. I couldn't bear to be with him any longer. From the moment I had that realization, my love and interest in my husband vanished, leaving only a feeling of emptiness and wondering what I had been doing all this time. My husband, still hopeful, desperately tried to win my favor but the gap that had formed between us couldn't be easily filled. It seemed my husband finally accepted my attitude and left a week later. Later, I heard through my brother-in-law that my husband started living alone in an apartment. My brother-in-law repeatedly apologized to me, saying, I'm sorry my brother caused trouble for such a long time. He also told me he wanted me to be happy. I'm sure my brother-in-law must have felt some resent towards his brother. Apparently, they aren't talking much anymore. I also heard that Linda has become quite meek since that day. Furthermore, the news of my divorce with my husband quickly spread at his workplace. People learned about his abusive behavior and harsh words towards me after marriage, and it seems he lost his place in the company. As for me, I started looking for a job after the divorce. A friend hooked me up, and now I'm working as a full-time employee. The workplace environment is great, and I'm having a blast, still living in that house, full of old memories. I'm done with you two. Just die here. My husband left those words hanging in the air as he abandoned me and our four-year-old daughter in a snowy mountain. Within the dense wilderness, I had no idea where we were. The icy winds bit into our bodies, making us shiver uncontrollably. We just have to follow grandma! My daughter suddenly exclaimed. I looked in the direction she pointed, but there was no one there. Still, I decided to follow her lead, because my beloved daughter has some strange power. My name is Nancy, a 32-year-old remote worker. I met my husband, Mark, of the same age, at a group blind date. Mark was a charismatic entrepreneur since college and a smooth talker. I fell in love with him and decided to get married. Mark's family was well respected in our local area, so our friends admired and envied our relationship. Shortly after our wedding, at the request of my in-laws, we moved in with them. They were kind people but my mother-in-law required constant care due to her frail health. Nancy, I heard you are a nurse. My wife is so frail and I've been so worried. We are grateful that you came into our lives. If I can be of any help, I am more than happy to do so, I replied. I quit my job as a nurse to take care for my mother-in-law and started working from home as I always wanted. 
I've always enjoyed web designing and creating websites, so I turned my hobby into my profession. It was a job I could do at my own pace, without any strict deadlines. However, one thing that bothered me was that even after three years of marriage, we hadn't been blessed with a child. Mark's business was thriving and expanding, opening branches here and there. But he got carried away with his success, frequently going out and rarely coming home. Listen, Mark, your mom isn't doing well. You should spend some time with her. I'm sure she wants to see you, even if she doesn't say so. Huh? You are there for her, aren't you? I'm busy. No matter how much I pleaded for his mother, Mark didn't listen. I wanted to show our child to my bedridden mother-in-law, who didn't have much time left, and I felt guilty that I couldn't do that. I'm sorry we couldn't give you a grandchild yet. Don't say that. I'm satisfied to have a daughter like you, Nancy. My kind mother-in-law was like my real mother, since I lost my parents at an early age. On days when the weather was good, I would take her for walks in her wheelchair or make nutritious soft-boiled food that she could have with ease. I did my best to make her life comfortable. One day, she called me to her bedside. I'm glad. You're going to have a lovely daughter soon. She'll be born around the time Jasmine will bloom, so name her Jasmine. Uh, I would be delighted if that's true. I was puzzled by my mother-in-law's strange words, thinking that maybe her sickness was causing her to hallucinate. Not long after, she passed away, leaving me utterly devastated. I had been by her side every day for the three years since we got married. Not long after the funeral, I discovered I was pregnant. The due date was in July, the season for Jasmine. Just as my mother-in-law said, it happened, and I was stunned, but more so, I was overwhelmed with joy. I couldn't wait for Mark to come home, so I could share the news. Mark! Listen! I'm pregnant! Wait, really? I'm not good with kids. I don't think I want any right now. Hey, are you being serious? If you want to have one so bad, go ahead. But I'm not taking care of it. You'll have to raise it on your own. You're deciding to have it, so you better figure out the finances yourself. I was left speechless by his harsh words. I could smell alcohol on him every day when he came home from work. His clothes reeked of sweet perfume. I had a good idea where my husband Mark was spending his time. For him, I was merely a convenient housemaid who took care of his parents. But I couldn't give up on the precious life growing inside me. I managed to get the necessary things using the money I saved from when I was single and the earnings I had from working. And just as my mother-in-law predicted, our daughter was born during Jasmine's blooming season. We named her Jasmine. She was a beautiful child with glowing skin who resembled my mother-in-law in some ways. Jasmine grew healthily, but she was a unique child. She would laugh and wave her hands when no one was around since she was a baby. When she started speaking broken words around the age of two, she began talking towards the family shrine. Grandma, do you like Jasmine? Jasmine loves Grandma too. Even when I asked Jasmine who she was talking to, she just smiled. When she was three, I often saw her deep in conversation with someone in the corner of our loft. Hey, Jasmine, who are you talking to and about what? Well, Grandma said she will give me her bracelet in the drawer. Grandma did. She said she knitted them using the fabric of her favorite sundress. Intrigued, I opened my mother-in-law's drawer. And there, I found a hand-knitted bracelet. Watching Jasmine happily wearing the bracelet, my father-in-law murmured nostalgically, Ah, those were made from the sundress my wife loved to wear when she was young. 
so she made them into bracelets. She was skilled at knitting. Surprisingly, it seems that Jasmine can truly communicate with my deceased mother-in-law. But fearing it might bring some harm to her, I decided not to disclose this to anyone. Our days were peaceful, but the good times didn't last forever. Mark was out splurging and abandoned his work. His company was now on the verge of collapsing. We could barely afford our living expenses, relying on the money my father-in-law provided and my earnings. Eventually, Mark had to ask his father for financial help. Thanks to that, his company was somehow able to recover. But would Mark, who continued to lead a carefree lifestyle, change? I was feeling skeptical. One day, Jasmine started saying something concerning. Daddy is planning to do something bad. What do you mean? I don't know, but Grandma seems worried. She told me to be careful. I didn't quite understand what she meant, but her words lingered in my mind. What kind of trouble could Mark get into? Is it something related to his company? A woman? Money? I thought about it, but without any evidence, I couldn't confront him. But just to be safe, I started carrying a voice recorder. And I told my daughter not to tell her father that she could see her grandmother. It was because I had a vague feeling of unease. Then I found numerous receipts from strip clubs and bars while going through Mark's stuff. Despite the company's financial struggle and even after asking his father for help, his habit of going out hadn't changed. I also found a note saying, consult the gang about the plan. What was the gang referring to? If what my daughter says is true, my mother-in-law has been warning us. It might be indicating that danger is approaching for me and Jasmine. I got shivers running down my spine. For several weeks afterward, I was on guard. But in the end, nothing more happened. Gradually, my sense of caution was pushed to the back of my mind, and I resumed my daily life. One day, my husband, unusually in high spirits, spoke to me. Thanks to dad's assistance, my business is doing better, and we're making greater profits. So, how about we go on a family vacation, after a long time? Long time? More like, for the first time. Oh, is it? Jasmine was so young. I booked a hot spring near an amusement park in the mountains. Jasmine will surely be thrilled. Is that... so? My heart was wavering. Though there are still some doubts about my husband, I couldn't completely ignore the desire to believe him, who was showing his gentle face, like old times. If my husband has genuinely changed his mind, this could be an opportunity to mend our relationship. With this thought, I agreed to the family trip. And as I prepared for the trip, I gradually forgot about what my daughter had said, and was excited about the long-awaited trip. On the day of the trip, I was surprised to see the rental car my husband had borrowed. It was equipped with snow tread tires, which made me slightly afraid, thinking we were heading into a snowy mountain. But I couldn't refuse at the last minute, fearing it would spoil the trip and my husband's mood. I quietly sat in the back seat of the car driven by my husband with my daughter. But in hindsight, I should have been more cautious. More than an hour after our departure, it felt like my husband was driving deep into the mountains, saying we were heading to the hot spring. Moreover, there was quite a lot of snow. Soon, we passed by the interstate and started driving on a side road, and I thought something was wrong. Hey dear, isn't this road strange? Do you think there would be a hotel on a mountain trail that's this off the interstate? Are you sure we're on the right route? But my husband didn't answer anything and continued driving, his frightening face frowning, looking straight ahead. Feeling anxious, I held my daughter tightly and bit my lip. And then, on the path where there was no road, my husband abruptly stopped the road. You two are of no use to me anymore. 
Sleep quietly here. Saying that, my husband dragged me and my four-year-old daughter out of the car. Oh, I almost forgot. I'll be taking your phone with me. Wait, dear. No matter how much I screamed, my husband ignored me. And the moment he started the car, he turned to us, smirked, and drove away. No way. We were left behind. Snow was falling all around, and we didn't even know where we were in the thick forest. My husband had taken my phone, but I had secretly put a spare one in my backpack. Unfortunately, there was no signal, and I couldn't call for help. Still, from the moment the car left the interstate, I had a bad feeling, and both Jasmine and I were wearing our winter coats and had our backpacks on. Moreover, since it was winter, I had many things packed in my bag for in case anything happened. Although I thought it would be fine, my daughter Jasmine's words had been lingering in my mind. I had prepared various things just in case, but I never expected this to happen. The wind that blew was as cold as ice, making me shiver down to my core. I took out a disposable hand warmer from my backpack, warmed my body, and calmed Jasmine down by giving her a caramel candy to chew on. Even as I did this, the snow only got worse and it seemed like we were going to end up stranded, all alone. What should we do? As I was at a loss, Jasmine suddenly shouted out, Mom! Grandma is saying she's coming over here! I looked in the direction Jasmine was pointing, but there was nobody there. No, I couldn't see anyone, but it seemed like Jasmine could. We should do as Grandma says. Jasmine confidently started to walk, and I decided to follow her. After all, she has a mysterious power. That's why I believed we'd somehow make it. I think that's what I wanted to believe. I walked carefully through the accumulating snow, holding Jasmine's hand tightly so as not to slip. Mom, I see a light! Grandma is telling us to go towards it. Indeed, I could see a light in the direction Jasmine was pointing. We're saved, I thought, feeling like I was about to burst into tears. Thank you, mother-in-law. I quietly whispered my gratitude to my mother-in-law. Finally reaching a hotel at the foot of the mountains, we decided to rest there to warm up. I had put extra cash in my backpack, so I knew we could stay for a while. And now, I began to plan my revenge on my husband. Don't think I'll forgive you for this. I'm going to thoroughly investigate why you wanted us dead. So be prepared. Five days later, I contacted my father-in-law. My father-in-law was very surprised to hear from me, but when he found out that Jasmine and I were safe, he was very happy and came to pick us up from the hotel. According to my father-in-law, my husband had been telling people that my daughter and I fell into a valley in the snowy mountains and died. I was flabbergasted. On top of that, he apparently said, We searched, but couldn't find them. It doesn't look like we'll be able to find them until spring, and it's sad to leave it at that, but we're going to hold the funeral first. Despite my father-in-law telling him to wait a little longer, he was going ahead with the preparations. Furthermore, my father-in-law handed me something. With that, I found out a shocking truth. Upon visiting my husband, sure enough, preparations were underway for our funeral. Large photographs of Jasmine and I were being displayed as portraits. Then, Jasmine and I suddenly appeared on the scene. What? How come? The relatives helping with the preparations were shocked, almost dropping to their knees. Stunned and staring wide-eyed at us, my husband blurted out a silly voice. Huh? You're... alive? Unfortunately for you, we're alive and well. Uh, how? You thought we would die as you planned, didn't you? 
after you left Jasmine and I deep in the snowy mountains. What are you talking about? People around us began to stir. No surprise there. If my husband intentionally left us, even though he told everyone we had fallen into a valley in the snowy mountains, this would be a serious crime. Stop lying! Can you say the same after hearing this? I played an audio from the hidden voice recorder I had. I don't need you guys anymore. Just die here. Mark's voice echoed, and the people present started to stir even more. I never said that. She's making up lies. He tried his best to shut me up, but his face was pale and his mouth was trembling. To finish him off, I played a video from my phone. In the video, Mark said, As planned, I abandoned them in the snow-capped mountains. With the life insurance money from my wife and daughter, my company can recover. And I can also enjoy a luxurious lifestyle. Of course, I'll also repay the loan I took from your group with some extra. So please, wait a little. The video perfectly captured him on the phone with someone in the car. He tried to shut off the camera in a hurry, but it was too late. Everyone was whispering, giving Mark cold, scornful looks. How did this get out? Who was it? I asked your father to copy the footage from the dash cam in the rental car you used. Dad, you abandoned your own son? Why would you side with a complete stranger? Mark said as he confronted my father-in-law. However, it seemed that my father-in-law was very angry, glaring at Mark with a terrifying expression. Well, it's no surprise that he would abandon you. After all, you secretly took out a large life insurance policy on not only Jasmine and me, but also on your father. That's... I wonder, when you mentioned group, did you borrow money from a sketchy organization and then targeted our lives? Unbelievable. My father-in-law stood imposingly, thrusting a life insurance policy he found in Mark's drawer at him and shouting, You were planning to kill me too, weren't you? You wanted all my assets to yourself, didn't you? How dare you call yourself my son? And so, with accusations from his father and evidence piling up, Mark, now cornered with no way out, made a startling statement. Look, everyone ended up alive, so it's all good, right? I was forced into doing this by loan sharks. I had it tough too, so forgive me. Don't make me laugh. There's no way I can forgive you. I'll be reporting this to the police. No way! We're a family! You can let this slide, right? Please? And so, Mark got on his knees and bowed in front of us. My father-in-law and I looked at each other in disbelief. I'm sorry. I'll change my ways. Please forgive me. Spare me from the police. I'll turn my life around. With his forehead rubbing against the floor, shedding tears, snot, and drool, Mark made a truly pitiful sight. There is absolutely no way I'm utterly disgusted with you. You can go to hell. Mark probably expected his apology to solve the situation, so hearing this, he was shocked. One of the relatives who had been listening to our exchange had apparently reported it to the police, and the police arrived to take Mark away. In the end, with all the evidence against him, Mark was convicted of a serious crime for attempting to take the lives of his wife, daughter, and his own father. He will likely be behind bars for a very long time. My husband's company went bankrupt, and it's clear that his life will be miserable even if he gets out from jail, as his family, including my father-in-law, have all turned their backs on him. Furthermore, his friends who led my husband astray have also been arrested. 
We obviously got divorced, and I won full custody of our daughter, Jasmine. In addition, at the earnest request of my father-in-law, Jasmine and I formed a special adoption bond with him and received his inheritance as a gift while he's still alive. Now, we live with my kind father-in-law. He and I enjoy watching over Jasmine's growth. My father-in-law often tells me, Find a good man and get remarried. I will give you my blessings. But for now, I have no intention of getting married. I am more than happy with my life right now. The other day, Jasmine whispered in my ear, Grandma says she's glad, but we can't meet her anymore, so she's saying goodbye. It made me a bit sad, but if it means that there's nothing my mother-in-law needs to protect us from anymore, then I guess it's a good thing. Dear mother-in-law, I will protect Jasmine with everything I have. I made a promise to her today as I placed my hands together in front of her grave. My name is Olivia Johnson and I'm 36 years old. I have a husband who is three years older than me and a son in elementary school. Five years ago, my husband had an accident that left him paralyzed from the waist down. My husband, who was once the best salesman in his department, had no choice but to quit his job. For him, losing his job was the hardest thing to accept. To escape from reality, my husband started lashing out at my son and me over trivial things. We had days where he would snap back to reality only after seeing our son cry. Once I got the hang of dealing with my husband and told my son to avoid his dad as much as possible when I wasn't around, the outbursts decreased. That's when I started working full time. Even so, it was impossible for me just starting a new job to earn as much as my husband used to. So I started to take up extra shifts to increase our income a bit. While it left me no time to rest, I worked relentlessly thinking it was for the sake of my family. Perhaps because of that, I failed to notice the changes in myself. I only realized it when a friend from high school whom I hadn't seen in a long time pointed it out. Looking at me, she said, You've changed a lot. I could tell from her expression that it wasn't meant as a compliment. We've always been honest with each other. Even so, she seemed at a loss for words. I was curious, so I asked her, have I changed that much? Don't worry, I won't get mad, just tell me honestly. Upon hearing my request, she spoke without hesitation. Okay, if you say so. You've changed so much, it's like you're a different person. You look extremely tired and your plain style and makeup are something the old Olivia would never wear. You look like you've aged by at least ten years. Even though I'd asked for honesty, her words hit me pretty hard but I couldn't deny it. I'm definitely not the person I used to be. When I was in my 20s, I was always checking out the latest fashion and makeup trends. Now I focus only on choosing functional, safe colors and don't even keep up with the latest trends. However, even after realizing this, I just don't have the luxury to enjoy fashion as I used to. Though I felt somewhat pessimistic, I reminded myself, this is only for now. In a few weeks, our multi-generational home will be completed. The plan is for my family and my in-laws to live there. My in-laws suggested this to help lighten my load a bit. I felt bad, but I took them up on their offer. My husband was all for it, too. Ever since we decided on the multi-generational home, my husband's been in high spirits. He, who is usually quiet and hard to read, has been starting conversations with me and our son more often lately. Our son, not used to his dad talking to him, seems confused but also a bit happy. At one point, my husband would yell at our son for unreasonable reasons. Because of that, our son became overly sensitive to his dad's mood. I had been struggling to find a way to improve the relationship between my son and my husband, hoping that living in a duplex might be a good start. 
But when our long-awaited duplex was finally completed, my husband told me that he had something to discuss. He mentioned that my mother-in-law would also be present, and I had a bad feeling about this. Despite my apprehension, my husband began to speak with a smile on his face. I can finally tell you, Olivia. I was advised to keep silent until the duplex was finished, but I've been looking forward to this day. I was puzzled, not quite grasping what he was trying to convey. Then, with a casual tone, as if he were talking about today's weather, he said, Olivia, let's get a divorce, and from now on, let's lead separate lives. It took me a few minutes to comprehend my husband's words. However, it seemed he took my silence as an agreement and triumphantly spread a divorce paper on the table. The document looked legitimate with signatures from both him and my in-laws. Unable to accept the reality, I looked up, thinking it might be some kind of distasteful prank, but my husband's expression instantly crumbled that thought. I felt a determined resolve in his eyes, a promise to absolutely divorce me. I instinctively turned to my mother-in-law for support, but with an unreadable expression, she simply said, sign the paper. I felt betrayed. I thought things were going well with both my husband and my mother-in-law, but perhaps it was only me. Tears welled up as I bit my lower lip and looked down. Meanwhile, my husband continued to speak. You can take our son, Olivia. He would be happier. Besides, with my health condition, it's impossible for me to take care of him. I cut him off. Hold on. I never agreed on getting a divorce. You never said anything about this. You can't just decide all this on your own. I voiced my displeasure during the brief silence. First off, what do you plan to do without me? Do you realize how much I've supported you? As soon as my husband heard these words, his expression changed. His face turned red and he glared at me, yelling, That's what I can't stand about you, your self-righteous way of talking. I didn't choose to be like this, yet you always look worn out acting as if you're the only one suffering. I felt blamed every time. I'm fed up with you and your victim complex. I lost my words hearing the true feelings of my husband. I couldn't hold back my tears anymore. Seeing me crying, my husband looked annoyed and said, See, you always play the victim, right, Mom? You'd agree that a wife like her who can't even respect her husband isn't suitable for me, right? Don't worry, my new partner is young and beautiful and I'm sure you'll like her. His words hit me like a punch to the gut. I finally understood the real reason why my husband wanted a divorce. He was having an affair, and he was trying to get rid of me, the obstacle, to be with his mistress. I never thought my husband would cheat on me, not because of his personality, but because I thought there was no chance for him to meet someone else, but I was wrong. He told me how he met his mistress. He met his lover online, and through texting each other every day, they developed feelings and fell in love. Because I only use my phone for minimal communication, learning about this whole online dating thing was bewildering. Looking back, my husband had been glued to his phone recently. Moreover, my husband, engrossed in his phone, seemed to be in an exceptionally good mood. Oblivious to my husband's affair, I would think to myself, it's nice to see him in a good mood today. Yet for all I know, he may have been secretly inviting that woman over to our place when I wasn't around. Just the thought of it was enough to make my blood boil. Despite our arguments, I had never once considered leaving him before. But now, after hearing his true feelings, I just couldn't imagine being with him any longer. Even if he took back his words and said, I don't want a divorce after all, I was now determined to leave him. As I made this decision, I heard a loud slap. Startled, I looked up to see my mother-in-law, her face twisted in an expression I had never seen before. My husband's cheek bore a red handprint. Realizing she had slapped him, I was taken aback. I would never have expected my mother-in-law to lay a hand on her son. She turned to me, deeply bowing her head in apology. I'm really sorry. I apologize for letting you take care of such a despicable son. She uttered these words, her face a mask of profound regret. Olivia, you're too good for my son. 
You've done so much for him, more than we could ever thank you for. My husband and I were looking forward to living with you two, but it seems you'll be better off without our son. We will make sure you receive proper alimony and child support, so please, go ahead and divorce him. My husband, his face beat red, tried to retort, but a glare from his mother shut him up. A different kind of tears welled up at my mother-in-law's words. They brought both relief and sadness. Regardless of my husband, I was saddened at the prospect of ending my relationship with my in-laws. Encouraged by my mother-in-law, I filled out the divorce papers. And just like that, my husband and I became strangers. After parting with my husband, I returned to my parents' house with my son. My parents said it was fine to stay with them until things settled down, so I decided to take them up on their offer. I planned to continue working as before, but discussed reducing my workload with my boss. I was considering changing jobs if needed, but my boss agreed to accommodate me without hesitation. To be honest, it took me by surprise. Apparently, my boss had been worried about my excessive workload for a while now. With a wry smile, he said, I was actually worried you might collapse one day, but knowing your situation at home, I didn't say anything. Feeling guilty, I bowed my head and apologized to my boss for causing him concern. He quickly shook his head, saying, No, no, it's just me worrying too much. But thinking about it, it's good that you left your ex-husband. And laughed. His words brought a smile to my face, and I nodded in agreement. I also told my co-workers about my divorce. I thought it would be better to let everyone know since I was reducing my workload. I was anxious about their reaction, but when I honestly told them the reason for my divorce, they threw a party for me. I was taken aback by this, but it was a relief that the atmosphere didn't become serious. Although I had awful luck with men, I had the best colleagues at my workplace. By the time all the paperwork had settled, I took our son and left my parents' home. We chose a small apartment as our new home. It was a far cry from the spacious house we were supposed to be living in, but our son didn't show any discontent. Perhaps because he no longer had to worry about his father, he became more vocal about his opinions and his demeanor brightened. It was a change that made me truly appreciate our separation from my ex-husband. The effects of the separation were apparent in me, too. By the time I'd finished unpacking after the move, a friend came to visit and celebrate our new home. The last time we met, she was concerned of my well-being, but when she saw me today, she laughed and said that I looked younger than ever. I couldn't help but laugh along. Everything started going smoothly, almost comically so, after the divorce. I suppose my old self was under so much stress, physically and mentally. Now I realized I was merely a maid for my ex-husband back then. I still can't forgive my ex-husband, and I don't want to see him but I do meet my in-laws once a month now. A while ago, my son got a fever, but I absolutely couldn't take a day off of work that day, and to make matters worse, my parents weren't available either. Out of desperation, I reached out to my in-laws. They immediately came over to take care of my son. We used to barely communicate due to the situation with my ex-husband, but since that day, we make sure to meet at least once a month. They thanked me for letting them see their grandson, but I was grateful that they still loved my son. Even after the divorce, my son occasionally mentioned his grandparents. He never said he wanted to see them, perhaps out of consideration for me, but he did ask how they were doing. After all, they were his beloved grandparents. To be honest, I didn't want to take his grandparents away from him, so it was a relief to know they wanted to see him too. By the way, my son never once mentioned my ex-husband. Even my in-laws knew that we didn't want to see him. However, my ex-husband had a different idea. I was utterly surprised when I heard from my mother-in-law that my ex-husband was considering getting back with us. I thought that things were going well with his mistress. According to my mother-in-law, the mistress moved in shortly after we left. It seemed like they had it all planned out. The mistress was delighted to see the new house and moved in without even getting permission from my in-laws. They were taken aback, but decided to act as if my ex-husband and his new partner didn't exist. 
At first, the mistress seemed pleased with the minimal interaction with my in-laws, but soon she started showing signs of discontent. Apparently, she thought that my in-laws would be helping with the household chores. She complained about it to my ex-husband. He then said to his parents, What's this all about? Didn't you promise to help with the housework? To this, my mother-in-law replied, We did promise, but that was with Olivia, not with you two. And she ignored anything he said after that. Left with no choice, my ex-husband tried to get the mistress to do everything that I used to do. At first, she reluctantly did as told, but every complaint from my ex-husband caused more strain between them, and then his mistress finally went off on him. She slammed the divorce papers at my ex-husband, saying, I'm not a maid or a nurse. This is not fun at all, and I can't stand being with you anymore. She left the house. I thought to myself, my ex is pretty bad, but that mistress is quite something too. My mother-in-law, with a bitter smile, commented that my ex-husband's behavior afterwards was the real problem. He refused to admit that he was at fault and blamed his mistress for getting dumped by saying that he got tricked by her. Furthermore, there was no one left to take care of my ex now that his mistress was gone. He couldn't rely on my in-laws either. As a result, for some reason, he thought that if we reconciled, everything would return to how it was. He probably has forgotten the things he did. He told my in-laws that he wanted to get back together with me and asked for their help. When I heard about this, I couldn't help but shudder at the thought of living with my ex again. My mother-in-law quickly reassured me, saying, Don't worry, we firmly refused. My ex, scolded by my in-laws, gave up on seeing me but now wanted to see our son. My in-laws also refused this. Finally, my in-laws told my ex that if he caused any more trouble to me or our son, they would sever family ties and kick him out. This finally made him give up. It would be difficult for my ex, who was well-received by his neighbors and friends, to live relying on others besides his family. I'm glad that my in-laws are not on my ex's side. From now on, I plan to make good use of my past experiences and do my best without pushing myself too hard. I also want to cherish the time with my son, make lots of memories that we couldn't before. My name is Catherine. I'm just an average stay-at-home mom. Well, I guess that's enough for today. My husband and I both work. Since I work from home, facing the computer all day, doing the household chores after work, is honestly exhausting. Better get started on dinner soon. Lately, my workload has increased, and it's been busy. While I'm happy to have more work, it's already challenging enough to do chores after work, and having even more work is both physically and mentally draining. Hmm, I've got more work piling up for tomorrow. At this rate, I might not be able to prepare dinner. What should I do? I'm home! Oh, welcome back. My husband is a regular office worker. He finishes work and is usually home by 6 p.m., so I need to have dinner ready by then. Dinner will be ready soon. What? It's not ready yet. I've been busy with work. Work? Oh, that thing you do on your computer. It can't be that hard. It is hard. I've been getting more work lately. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's have dinner. My husband thinks my job is just to play with my computer at home and considers it a piece of cake. So he walks around the house with a big attitude, thinking he's the one providing for the family. He dumps all the household chores on me and does nothing when he gets home, just watching TV and laying around the house. Hey, could you lend a hand? I've been out working all day. I'm tired. You've just been at home. That's not true. I'm working and bringing in income, right? It's not even much, I bet. My husband seems to think that my earnings are just a drop in the bucket. He's old-fashioned in his thinking, believing that work should be done in an office, sweating bullets, and seems to look down on my home-based job. He once said that women should just handle things at home, but in reality, our household can't survive on his salary alone. We are only able to live thanks to my income, but since I handle all the payments, he seems to think that we can live on his salary alone. 
Moreover, he only contributes about $300 a month to the household, and the rest goes to gambling and alcohol. My husband is still childlike for his age, and it's quite troublesome. That sounds tough, but isn't it natural to see the unpleasant sides of your partner after marriage? It's beyond that level with mine. I occasionally vent my frustrations to my cousin Jack. It's hard to cope with the stress if I don't have someone to talk to. Jack and I have been close since we were little. I've always turned to him to vent whenever something bothers me. He listened to me when I was considering marrying my husband, but for some reason, Jack was strongly opposed to it. Now, I understand very well why he was against it. My husband had never lived alone before our marriage. He lived with his parents, so he doesn't understand how much it costs to live. I see. Yes, that's why he thinks he can live on just about $300 a month, and that's all he contributes to the household. That's definitely a problem. I've told him many times that you can't live off of just $300, but he just won't believe me, accusing me of lying. Before I started working, I remember saying how tough life was. But he never listened, always blaming it on me spending too much, even when I said our income now should be enough. So out of necessity, I had to restart the part-time job I used to do when I was single. Now I've gotten more projects, and it's practically become my main job. Oh, <sighs> work is tough. Household chores are tough. I'm just so tired. Yeah, you do seem tired. Lately, it just feels like I can't get rid of this fatigue. You know, you might want to take it easy. Even after hearing that, if I don't handle both work and household chores, things at home get messy. After parting ways with Jack, I returned home and continued to work remotely. Today, there were a lot of projects and it took quite a bit of time. Oh no, look at the time! What am I gonna do? I was so engrossed in work, I didn't notice at all. My husband will be home soon. I haven't prepared dinner and I just don't have the energy to cook tonight. No choice then, let's just order takeout today. Reluctantly, I ordered a pizza for dinner. I'm home! Welcome back! Where's dinner? Well, today was a bit hectic and I didn't get a chance to prepare anything, so I ordered pizza. Please, have some. What? Saying that, he ate the pizza silently, looking somewhat discontented. You know, it would be nice if you could manage household chores properly. I'm busy working every day. I'm busy with work too. And on top of that, I'm doing household chores. It's okay once in a while, isn't it? You're probably just laying around at home every day. You should be able to manage household chores properly. What? You're living off my income, laying around at home? You're like a parasite. What did you just say? I felt a surge of anger at his words. You called me a parasite? That's right. You're just laying around, not doing household chores as you should, living off my income? You are a parasite. Don't be ridiculous. There's no way we can live on your measly salary alone. The reason we're able to maintain our living is only because I'm working too. What are you talking about? $300 a month should be more than enough to live on. There is no way that's true. How out of touch with reality are you? You're the one that's out of touch with reality. I know people who live perfectly fine on the same salary. They live alone in their parents' house, don't they? This issue turned into a big argument. No matter how much I explain about our living expenses, he doesn't believe me. He accuses me of lying and doesn't even listen to what I'm saying. He called me a parasite. He's terrible. I never thought he was like that before we got married. Are you thinking about a divorce, maybe? I'm definitely considering it. I'm fed up with his ignorance of the real world. I told you, didn't I? You should have reconsidered marrying that man. I understand the meaning of those words now. It's natural to consider divorce from a man who called you a parasite, who doesn't appreciate your work, and who doesn't have a grasp of the money necessary for living. However, if he could change his mind by what I say, wouldn't this life also change? In that case, there would be no need to separate. It's the person I chose, so I'll try to talk to him a little more. Hang in there. I know. 
he never really listened to people's advice. Speaking of which, you were in the same school as my husband. From what I hear, he doesn't seem to have changed much from his student days. The next day, I talked to him about the necessary expenses incurred every month. It's not possible to live our current lifestyle with just $300. I wanted him to understand first how much it costs us each month, but he wouldn't listen. No matter how much I explained, he would say, It's just because you're spending too much. Blaming it on my lack of effort. I'm telling you, these are necessary expenses. This is the amount of cash flow just for our basic needs. There's no way. If we save, we should be able to live on about $300 a month. We're paying this much for rent every month and this much for utilities. There's no way! My buddy said he can live on $300 a month. He bought a condo outright, didn't he? We're in a rental. We have to pay rent every month. There's no way we can do with $300. No matter how much I explained, he wouldn't believe me. He's adamant that we can live on my salary alone. No matter how much I said, he wouldn't listen, so I stopped trying to convince him. And then came one day. Jack showed up at my house. He rarely came over to our place. What's up? You came all of a sudden. Well, I actually saw your husband downtown last night. And what about it? He was walking with some young girl. What? While eating out, Jack seemed to have spotted my husband walking with an unfamiliar woman. They were close together and it seemed they were quite familiar with each other. Jack suspected that my husband was cheating and decided to contact me. But he said he was having a drink with his colleagues last night. Oh, did he? I have some evidence, by the way. Jack showed me a photo of my husband and the unknown woman together. The two of them were arm in arm, looking friendly as they walked. He was cheating on me while I was struggling with work and household chores. Who's the one wasting money now? All that talk, just to be cheating on me. What are you going to do? Do you even have to ask? I started gathering evidence of the affair with Jack's help. I'm going to have a drink with some guys from work. My husband occasionally went out at night. He usually said he was going out for drinks with his colleagues. I bet he's going to see that woman. I followed him and caught him on camera meeting with his lover many times. Two weeks passed. I gathered the evidence and confronted him. What's this all about? Ah, got busted, huh? You're gonna tough it out, huh? When I presented the evidence, he started talking defiantly. I've been thinking... I can't continue living with a leech like you. Huh? You're the worst. Yeah, I was thinking of getting a divorce, so this works out. Well, I don't want someone like you either. We ended up getting a divorce before I could interrogate him further. The next day, I got a divorce form from the city hall, filled it out the same day, and prepared to pack up and leave. I wanted to get away from that husband as soon as possible. Jack helped me find a new place to live. Jack works at a real estate company, so we were able to find a reasonable property right away. Here you go. With this, the divorce is finalized. Get out. Quick. I'd do it even without you telling me. Thanks for everything up until now. I moved my personal belongings to my new home and left my old house behind. I had no lingering attachments. Now, I have no one berating me. No more worrying about family matters and no more doing chores for two. Quite the opposite, things only got better. Have you gotten divorced already? I feel liberated. Well, that's good. Don't push yourself too hard from now on. No more stress, and I plan on focusing on my work. I think I'm good on marriage for a while. How's the new house? It's beautiful, with lots of sunlight. Absolutely perfect. Rent might be a bit higher though, is that okay? It's cheaper than my old place, and I'm living alone now, so my expenses have actually gone down. Well, that's a relief. How much do you make a month, by the way? About 3k. Wow, you can really make a living working from home. I've been steadily doing it for a while. Now, I was getting more assignments and had a steady income. But why didn't you say anything about it? Maybe his attitude would have changed a little. I knew he wouldn't believe me. 
I thought it was pointless to say anything. He probably wouldn't. You're right. Then, I started focusing more on my work. Being able to work without any interference brought me a lot of mental relief, and my work was going well. My income increased, and I could afford to buy what I wanted. Now I often wonder, why didn't I divorce earlier? I got a phone call. Hmm, who could it be? It was my ex-husband, whom I had divorced a month ago. Hello, Catherine. Why does it cost so much to live? How did you manage to pay everything? Excuse me? He was talking about the cost of living at the house he used to pay for. It's too expensive. How did you manage it? He asked in a somewhat frantic manner. I've explained it before, right? All the living expenses just for basic bills. Every month. That must be because you were wasting money. Just tell me how you managed. I can't live like this. I wasn't particularly managing anything. I was working and earning my own income. That's how we were able to live. You couldn't have been making much. You didn't even work for a while after we got married. I was living off the savings from my single days at that time. Upon hearing this, my ex-husband fell silent. I saw this coming. Without me, he probably couldn't make ends meet with his salary alone. I knew this, but deliberately chose not to tell him. I've told you several times, but you never believed me. Then how come my friends are able to live? That's strange. Why don't you ask your friends? What should I do? I can't even afford to eat tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. We're strangers now that we've broken up, and I am a parasite, so I don't know how to save you. Please, can we get back together? Why don't you have your mistress take care of you? I got dumped. Please, I won't call you a parasite anymore. You signed the divorce papers, remember? And don't forget about the alimony. It's your infidelity that led to our divorce. There's no way I can pay all that. This isn't a request. It's a demand. Please, I beg you, give me a break. Well then, sort it out yourself. You're a grown man after all. W wait! I hung up the phone and deleted his number. I didn't want to be contacted anymore. My ex-husband, it seems, had been unable to pay for things like the house rent and utility bills, and was kicked out of his apartment. It seems that he tried to live alone again, and went to the real estate company where Jack worked, but apparently he didn't even know the average rent, and seems to have given up after learning about it. It seems that afterwards, he was living at his parents' house, but he had a quarrel with them and had to leave, starting to live alone reluctantly. He had always been sloppy with money, and he quickly fell behind on his rent and was kicked out of his apartment too. Apparently, he lost his address, caused problems at work, and got fired. And now, he's unemployed. The other day, I saw your ex-husband. Really? Where? He was lined up at a soup kitchen for the homeless. It can't be helped. He just doesn't know how the real world works. Even so, who would have thought that he would be dumped by his mistress right after they broke up? Wasn't the mistress just a fling to begin with? That might be true. I mean, there's no way there will be a woman who would fall for a guy like that. After the divorce, I started hanging out with Jack more often. We used to dine together a lot when we were single, but the frequency decreased when I got married. I never thought I'd be single again. But it's fun to eat dinner together like this, and badmouth my ex-husband. My name is Mary, and I'm getting close to my late 50s this year. I have two children, my elder son has become a working adult and is planning to get married to his girlfriend soon. My eldest daughter is currently a college student, and though she seems to be working hard every day, she appears to be thoroughly enjoying her university life. With my children growing up, I've almost finished my duties as a mother, and being a former nurse, I'm considering returning to the caregiving profession. One day, I got the shocking news that my father-in-law, Bob, had suffered a stroke. I received a call from my husband, John, and rushed to the hospital where Bob was admitted. Bob has always been a very earnest man, gentle, and has been very kind to me, his daughter-in-law. However, I have been worried because he hasn't been in good spirits since his wife, Alice, passed away three years ago. 
I occasionally visited his house to check on him and noticed a clear lack of energy, so we had been frequently inviting him out with the kids. Amidst this, when I had just begun to notice a return of vitality to Bob, the news of his stroke filled me with unease. When I arrived at the hospital, Bob's daughter and her husband were there, engaged in some conversation. Sorry I'm late. How, how's Bob doing? I asked, catching my breath as I approached John's sister, Isabella. Isabella sighed in irritation when she noticed me and said, You're late. We have somewhere to be, so can you take it from here? With that, she left briskly. Isabella has always seemed indifferent to Bob, often treating him coldly. Not only Bob, but she was the same with Alice when she was alive. Bob and Alice were such kind people, and they never said anything to her. But I think that that's what made her what she is now. For now, I paced around the waiting area nervously while Bob was presumably in surgery. In the meantime, John arrived at the hospital. Mary, how's Dad? John was obviously worried. Sweat dripped from his forehead and his dress shirt was soaked with perspiration. When I shook my head, John dropped the bags he was carrying, his face pale. No, no way. I quickly corrected him. No, he's still in surgery. We don't know yet. John seemed to relax a bit, picking up his fallen bags and sinking into a chair. Should we prepare ourselves? I rushed over to John, who looked on the verge of tears and put my hand on his back. No, it, it's going to be okay. I felt helpless, not being able to say anything else, but I couldn't think of anything else to say. A few hours later, the surgery ended, and we were told by the doctor to come into a small room for an explanation. The surgery was successful, however, he will most likely have some lasting effects. In other words, we were told Bob would need care. While I do hope for Bob's wellness, if it comes to providing care, this also involves Isabella and her husband. John and I decided to call Isabella to discuss this. As a result, we agreed to talk things out and arranged a meeting at Bob's house while he was still in the hospital. I'm not going to look after him, Isabella announced as soon as the discussion started, shocking John and me. Wait, if you're not going to, what are we supposed to do? I don't care. You two can take care of him, my sister-in-law Isabella said, idly fiddling with her neatly decorated nails that were done somewhere. Her husband, Tom, nodded in agreement. What about a nursing home? What on earth are you talking about? I don't intend to waste money. This is what happens whenever I step in. Isabella glares at me with a look of the devil on her face. It feels like I'm not allowed to voice an opinion, so I shut my mouth. If he can't go to a facility, and you girls won't look after him, then what are we going to do? That's why you guys should take care of him. I don't need some decrepit poverty god in my house. Isabella giggles as she speaks. Even I, normally patient, lost my cool at that. That's too much. Even for you. He's your father. I don't care. Why is it that just because he's my father, I have to be the one to look after him? Besides, he's John's father too. I've been saying you guys should look after him. There's nothing I can say to that. If we could take care of him at home, I would love to. But our house isn't fully accessible. There are many steps and level differences. If we were to take in my father-in-law, we'd have to remodel our house. And we don't have enough funds for that. Mary, don't you have a care worker certification? Taking care of dad should be easy, right? I was at a loss for words at Isabella's smug face. John, too, seemed to feel the same, and we decided to take the issue home for the time being, leaving our in-laws' house behind. What should we do? Mary, you were thinking about going back to your care work. That's okay. I wasn't absolutely set on going back, so don't worry about it, I gently said to a troubled John. The issue is the money. I don't mind taking in your father, but if we do... We'll need to make this house accessible so he won't fall, and medical equipment isn't cheap. 
You're right. I wonder if it'll cost about a hundred thousand dollars. That's just a rough estimate, but if we think about adjusting the entire first floor for him to live on, that's about how much it'd cost. Our eldest daughter is still in college, so we don't have that much money. We still have a mortgage on the house, and the thought of adding a loan for renovations is daunting. I feel terrible about this, but should we ask him to go to a facility? The question is, can we even get him in one? The waiting lists are long, and the costs aren't negligible. I'm sure Isabella and her family won't help. There seems to be no solution in sight. We decided to at least hear out my father-in-law's opinion, and I alone went to the hospital where he was hospitalized. Upon entering his room, I found my father-in-law had recovered considerably and greeted me with a smile. <laughs> Sorry for all the trouble. Every time I visited, my father-in-law would say something like this. Why would you say that? Now, I've brought you one of your favorite books today. According to the doctor, my father-in-law suffered a stroke on one side of his body and could no longer move the right half of his body on his own. Because of this, when reading a book, he would place it on the table and use something heavy to keep the pages from turning on their own. Ah, thank you. My father-in-law took the book I had brought and placed it by his pillow. Dad, I came today because I wanted to talk about something. It's about what's to come. At this, my father-in-law smiled warmly. Oh, I know. I'll be okay, even in a nursing home. I have saved up for it, so you don't have to worry. Despite his words, I could see a hint of loneliness in his expression. Well, Dad... If you're okay with it, why not come to our house? I've worked in elderly care before, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I have time. And, and John's there, too. That's right. Let's live together. I blurted out the words, seeing his lonely expression. My father-in-law looked at me in surprise. That's a kind offer. He must have felt it somewhere within him, that he couldn't go back to his own house anymore. His own house, where his daughter Isabella and her husband are living and I can see them treating him as an inconvenience if he were to return, ultimately leading him to a nursing home. Thinking this, I felt a pang of sadness. I had initially planned to listen to my father-in-law's feelings and proceed with the conversation accordingly, but I got ahead of myself. I felt somewhat guilty towards my husband, John, but I knew he would understand. Now, all that was left was to somehow arrange for his aftercare before his discharge. The problem was the cost. I decided to consult Isabella once. With these thoughts, I headed home. When John came back from work and I told him what had happened at the hospital, he looked a bit troubled but agreed as if he had known it would come to this. John called Isabella right there. That's why we're asking for your help, because we're the ones who are going to be looking after Dad. It seemed like John and Isabella were arguing over the phone, and John's tone was getting a little harsh. With a sigh, he hung up the phone. John explained his conversation with Isabella. It seemed she was refusing to give any money, and there was nothing we could do about it. For the sake of my father-in-law, John began to discuss how we could handle the costs. After that, our house got a bit noisy. We discussed how to renovate the house and what kind of care supplies we'd need, and received various explanations about home care. When I told my father-in-law that he would be living with us after he was discharged, he looked apologetic, but also pleased. Mary, could you get the checkbook that's over there? My recovered father-in-law pointed at a cloth bag on the shelf during one of our visits. Wondering what he'd use a checkbook for, I did as he asked and took it out. Watching my father-in-law, I saw him open the bank book and show it to me. I have some money here. Can you and John use it? The checkbook he showed me had an amount written in it that I had never seen before. When I froze seeing this, my father-in-law laughed and said, You and John will be taking care of me from now on, right? I heard about you getting a new car and making the house accessible. Would ten million dollars be enough for that? T ten million? I hadn't counted the zeros, but I was shocked at the number of ten million dollars. I had no idea why my father-in-law had saved so much money, but apparently after my mother-in-law passed away, 
he didn't feel like doing anything and decided to venture into the investments he had been studying for a while. It seems to have worked out better than expected, and his savings began to accumulate quickly. He was not a big spender, so he only kept on saving. However, even if he wanted to remodel the house or buy a new car, it shouldn't cost that much. I handed his bank book back to him and said, I, I can't accept this much. Please use this for yourself. He, in turn, offered the bank book back to me, saying, oh, I can't use all this money. I would rather give it back to you and your family, who are willing to take care of me. Stuck with the predicament of the returned bank book again, I refused. Still, I can't accept so much. My father-in-law, after contemplating for a while with a troubled look, proposed, What about a million dollars? Seeing no end to this, I managed to persuade him to agree to a reduced sum of a hundred thousand dollars. He still seemed dissatisfied, but for the moment that was good. As such an exchange was going on, I'm here! Isabella appeared out of nowhere. With the entrance of Isabella, who was oblivious to money matters, I hurriedly shoved my father-in-law's bank book back into its original place. Seeing this, my sister-in-law Isabella frowned and asked, What's going on? With a hint of worry in her voice. I was relieved that she hadn't heard our previous conversation. Isabella had come to bring some clothes for our father. After chatting for a bit, we both left the hospital room. But on our way home, Isabella suddenly said that she had something to discuss and suggested we stop by a coffee shop. Her talks have never been about anything good in the past, so I assumed this wouldn't be any different. I reluctantly agreed, but it turned out to be a mistake. I will take care of Dad. What? At the sudden proposal, I was taken aback. Despite her words, we're already in the middle of preparations to accommodate my father-in-law, even starting renovations on the house. I couldn't help but wonder why she would suddenly propose such a thing. So, you don't have to visit the hospital from tomorrow. No, visiting has nothing to do with it. There's no rule stating that only the caretaker should visit, so why would she say such a thing? Although I had doubts about Isabella's statement, I suggested we discuss it at another time and left the cafe. When I told my husband John about this at home, he pondered over it and suddenly seemed to connect the dots. She must have overheard about the savings. Although I had a hunch about it, it seems that that was the case, John said. Otherwise, there's no way she would accept the caretaking, especially considering she was so opposed to it until recently. I had vaguely suspected that she had found out about the money and was trying to curry favor to inherit all of it. She might even come up with some excuse to start spending it. But what should we do? I asked. I have an idea. Let's let her take a shot, said John, with a sly grin on his face indicating he was up to something. Feeling uneasy about his plan, I decided to keep quiet and follow Isabella's request for now. I had conveyed to my father-in-law that he wouldn't need to worry about money and that his daughter Isabella would be providing care. His response was ambiguous, a vague expression not quite affirming or denying his understanding. And with that, the conversation ended. Afterward, he was safely discharged from the hospital and returned to his family home in Nebraska where Isabella resided. When my father-in-law was discharged, I had the chance to inspect the family home. The state of the house was unclear, there was no renovation, and it was questionable whether there were enough caregiving supplies. I doubted if real caregiving could happen in such conditions, however, this was Isabella's choice. I felt it was not my place to comment, so I decided to keep quiet. Two months later, I got a call from Isabella. Mary, I can't do this anymore. Please come over right now. She sounded frantic over the phone, so I responded and hurried over to the house in Nebraska. When I arrived, the house was messy and there was a disgusting odor in the air. As I was wondering what happened, Isabella appeared looking more disheveled than ever. She had dark circles under her eyes, and her walk was unsteady. Are you okay? 
I rushed over to Isabella, clearly in a bad state. Isabella grabbed my hand and said, Take Dad away. At first, I didn't understand what she meant, but after calming her down and getting her to explain, it seemed she had underestimated the challenges of caregiving. The duties extended from assistance with walking and meals to dealing with incontinence, which also meant dealing with diapers. It was overwhelming for her, not being able to handle anything around the house or even look at herself. I told her I couldn't make any decisions right then and promised to contact her as soon as possible. I took this matter home with me. It lasted two months. That's impressive. My husband John muttered as he glanced at the calendar. Apparently he had seen this coming. He proposed we go and pick up my father-in-law on his next day off, and I agreed. A few days later, when we arrived at the family home in Nebraska, my father-in-law was already packed and ready to leave. I felt relieved that I could finally take him home. I've endured for two months, and I used to live here too, so, so I deserve at least five million dollars, Isabella said out of the blue as we were about to help my father-in-law into the car. I was so startled that I stopped in my tracks. John, too, was taken aback and turned to look at Isabella. Unfazed, she had a smug expression on her face. What are you talking about, Isabella? This is not the time or place to talk about money, especially in front of Dad. He raised us, after all. John tried to reason with her, but it seemed to have no effect. I'm his daughter. It's only fair that I get paid. Her defiant response surprised me. How could she be so brazen? I questioned Isabella's personality. Enough, Isabella. You shouldn't be talking about such unsavory matters. And besides, you've already received money, my father-in-law injected with a disbelieving expression. There's none left. Just five million dollars. What's so hard about that? If you're just going to wither away, you might as well put it to good use. Sis! I was taken aback. To think she would dare to speak in such a manner to her own father. I stood frozen in surprise. Even my usually composed husband, John, seemed to be seething at Isabella's words, his face turning beet red as he glared at her. John, it's okay. She's speaking the truth. In an attempt to soothe his riled up son, Bob, my father-in-law, gently reassured him and then turned to Isabella with a stern expression. Isabella, you are no longer my child. Leave this house. His words were icy, to the point. Upon hearing this, Isabella froze in shock. What? What are you talking about? I'm your only daughter. I only have a son, and this kind and caring woman here is my daughter-in-law. I don't know you anymore. Take your foolish husband and leave. Having only heard the soft-spoken side of my father-in-law, Bob, I was astonished at the harsh tone now. Looking at Bob, his eyes were hardened, not permitting any defiance. It seemed as though that the message was being conveyed. Even Isabella was silenced by his dominance. Well then, shall we go? We're counting on you moving forward. It was as if the face from earlier had disappeared. Bob was back to his usual self, and he smiled at me. John and I had no choice but to follow his words. We drove back home, leaving a stunned Isabella standing in place. Apparently, Bob later arranged through his lawyer for a last will and testament, stating that the inheritance would go only to John, and ensuring that no portion of it would end up with Isabella. Though the house became vacant with Isabella's departure, John and I wanted to live there, and Bob was happy to oblige. Isabella and her husband moved out and into an apartment, and it seemed that they had been using a significant amount of Bob's money even when he was in good health. Their spendthrift habits led them into debt, and now they're struggling to pay it back. Every day I can't help but think that this is the inevitable outcome for someone like Isabella, who can't respect or repay her parent even if he's her biological father. While caring for Bob is indeed tough, as a person who has been in the caregiving profession, it doesn't feel like a burden to me and we're able to maintain a good relationship. I'm Sally, a 50-year-old housewife. Both of my children are working adults. They've left home, 
and are living on their own. Now that they're independent, I've started working from home in addition to my housewife duties. My husband has been very supportive of me working from home. At first, I was only able to make around $200 a month, but gradually, my income increased to $600, then $800. I'm grateful to the clients who give me work. My sister-in-law's family also lives in the same neighborhood. She's my husband's twin sister, so she's the same age as him. My husband and I are the same age as well, so inevitably, I'm also the same age as my sister-in-law. We became somewhat close from the beginning, but I've always disliked my sister-in-law and even talking to her was bothersome. My husband also consistently expressed his dislike for his sister. I suppose she's always been arrogant. She's very conceited, loves to look down on people, the type of woman who loves to show off, and it's quite annoying. At her place, she has a bedridden son. For me, he's my nephew. Tommy is 24. He has suffered from a serious illness since he was little, and he can hardly move his body. Therefore, he has always lived in bed. One day, my sister-in-law texted me. It was a snide and condescending text. I'm going to be in Hawaii starting today. I booked a luxury hotel and I'll be enjoying a whole week there. Well, I guess you can't go, right? Because my poor little brother doesn't make much money. Aren't you guys such a poor middle-aged couple? You're probably on the verge of divorce. <laughs> huh? I'm going to be in a swimsuit attracting everyone's attention on the beach. You, with your matronly figure, can't even wear a swimsuit, right? Your belly must be saggy after having two kids. <laughs> but I only have Tommy, so I'm still slim and firm. Nobody would guess I'm 50. Not like you, a fat old woman. How rude could she be? It's true that I have two children. They were born close together so my body didn't snap back right away. Even now, I can't say I have a toned, beautiful belly. I have a matronly figure, but so does my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law seems to have a lot of confidence in herself, but to me, she's the same level. If she was a very beautiful and well-shaped person, I might be able to tolerate her comments. But why do I have to hear this from my sister-in-law? Moreover, I wondered what she was going to do with Tommy. So what's going to happen with Tommy? Are you leaving him somewhere or having someone come in every day? Even staying overnight? Huh? There's no way I'm doing that. It's a hassle. He'll be fine just sleeping at home, won't he? Anyway, I left some drinks and things by his bed. That's horrible. How can you do such a thing? What? I don't need to be told by someone like you who hasn't had any hardship. My life is messed up because of him. I shouldn't have had a son like that. Well then, I'll take care of him. I'll go get Tommy now. Do whatever you want. I'll be happy if he's gone. Just wait. I'll be there shortly. And so, I headed towards my sister-in-law's house. It's a mere five-minute drive, so it's very close. Tommy is bedridden and uses a special wheelchair to get around. That's why I headed there in a station wagon, which can accommodate a wheelchair. You really came for this kind of guy. Yes, I did, because I feel sorry for Tommy. He's just a burden, just lazing around doing nothing at his age. Well, you're also a full-time housewife living around, so you're perfect for each other. I'm doing remote work, you know. I'm not a housewife loafing around, and not all housewives are loafers, right? Pfft, remote work, huh? That's not a real job. Both my husband and I are full-time employees. You're basically just a housewife. It'd serve you right to spend the rest of your life taking care of Tommy. Oh, is that so? Let's go, Tommy. Okay. Tommy seemed to be rather downcast. It can't be helped, as he's being treated like this by his biological mother. I understand that taking care of a sick child is very difficult, but it's too cruel to say such things right in front of him. At the very least, if she has to vent, I wish she would do it somewhere out of the child's sight. It doesn't matter whether the child is an adult, because anyone in the same situation will definitely get hurt. After some time, I managed to bring Tommy to our house. Then my husband came home. Huh? Tommy? Why are you here? Uncle David, I'm sorry. The truth is, your sister was going to leave Tommy behind because she's going on vacation, so I said I'd bring him home. I'm sorry for doing this without consulting you first. No, it's alright. My sister must have lost her mind. 
Leaving him behind is just the lowest. Tommy, feel free to stay here from now on. We'll take good care of you. Uncle David, that's right, you don't have to worry about anything. I've loved you since you were a kid. Thank you, Aunt Sally. I absolutely detest my sister-in-law and her husband. They're terribly malicious and the worst kind of people. However, I've always liked Tommy. Despite suffering from his illness, he's overflowing with empathy for others. And above all, he's very smart. I don't think he's been able to attend special education school much, but he was naturally bright to begin with. I've always thought that he was the definition of a smart kid. I heard my sister-in-law and her husband left for Hawaii after that. I was shocked that they really intended to go to Hawaii, leaving behind their bedridden son. I wonder what they would do if something happened to him. They wouldn't be able to come back right away. My husband was equally astounded. Seriously, my sister and her husband must be out of their minds. Going to Hawaii and leaving Tommy behind? I agree. I might be out of place saying this since I've never taken care of him, but... To leave him without making use of any care services or facilities? If that message hadn't come, Tommy would have been left behind without us even noticing. Gives me the chills. Yes, it's really horrible. Indeed, I've never cared for a child with a serious illness. My in-laws are still very much alive and well, and they've always said that if they ever become unable to move, they'll go to a senior home. So I've never been a caregiver either. That's why I didn't feel in a position to criticize my sister-in-law but I still can't fathom how she could just leave her son with only a drink and abandon him. The child has a serious illness, so they can receive welfare support, and if they need to travel far, they can also use short-term care facilities. My sister-in-law and her family returned home. They came all the way to our home just to insult us. Here, this is a souvenir. It's perfect for you guys. What's this? They're seashells we picked up at the beach. We have plenty, so we're giving some to you. We don't want them. Oh, really? You're rejecting my kindness. Would you prefer this driftwood then? We don't want any of them. By the way, is Tommy doing okay? Not that I care about such a useless child. That's cruel. How could you say such a thing about your own son? What? What do you know? It's just the worst, having given birth to him only to find out he has a severe illness. I want the money I spent on raising him back. You can only say that because you don't understand how I feel, having lived for such a useless son. Oh, really? So, about what you said before, about leaving him to us? You're fine with us adopting him, then? Do whatever you want. Who in their right mind would adopt a child like that? Are you out of your mind? It's not crazy. I'm serious. With that, I closed the door. My sister-in-law and her husband left after that. My husband and I decided to adopt Tommy as our own. And so... Tommy became our child. He had been shocked by being abandoned by his biological parents, but gradually he began to smile in our home. He is bedridden, but he can use his hands, so he freely used tablets and smartphones while lying down. One day, Tommy seemed very happy. Look, my work is going to be published in a literary magazine. What? A literary magazine? I've been writing novels as a hobby. Because I'm bedridden, it's the only thing I can do. It's a little embarrassing hobby, though. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's a great hobby. Can I take a look? Yeah, this is the first one I wrote. I decided to read the short story that Tommy said he had written. It was very well done. It really hit home. This is amazing. I can't believe how good it is. I can't really describe my feelings in words. I just tried writing it on my tablet, and it was surprisingly well received. So then I wrote a medium-length story. And this one, too. This one got published in the magazine. I see. I had no idea you had such a talent. I showed it to my husband as well. He, being an avid reader, was utterly impressed. This is amazing. It feels like pure literature. Yeah, I admire Fitzgerald and Hemingway. I also like Dostoevsky and Hesse. Hmm, so that's why you wrapped it up like this. It gives off a somewhat melancholic feeling. The authors you mentioned, their works are indeed sorrowful or rather tragic. Thanks. That's what I aim for. Thus, Tommy's novel was set to be published in hardcover. He chose to use a pseudonym as an author, Scott Wheel. He took Scott from F. Scott Fitzgerald and Wheel from Herman Hesse's Beneath the Wheel. Soon, author Scott Wheel's book became a smash hit. It seemed to be selling out rapidly at bookstores. There was even a dedicated section for his books at the local bookstore, 
which made me happy. Then, Tommy won the Pulitzer Prize. We were all surprised. I won the Pulitzer Prize? That's amazing. You really did work hard for this. Oh, Tommy's wonderful talent has been recognized by the world. There's nothing more joyful. Yes, even someone bedridden like me can become a recognized writer. No one should ever give up on their dreams. I need to take a page out of your book. Then, a press conference was arranged. Of course, without us. Tommy couldn't go on stage. He needed to be seated in a special wheelchair. His upper body needed to be secured. I wheeled him into the venue. Tommy seemed tense, his facial expression showing nervousness. Finally, the press conference began. Tommy was in front of many flashing cameras. The live television broadcast began as well. I, Scott Wu, am a bedridden author. Since childhood, I've suffered from a serious illness and spent most of my time in bed. However, reading books was my escape. So I decided that I too wanted to be an author and bring everyone some inspiration. I'm grateful to everyone who read my books and to my step-parents who adopted me. After Tommy's speech, the journalists started asking questions. Some were rather insensitive. They probed about why he was adopted. To this, Tommy responded, My real mother was very troubled due to my illness. She probably grew to dislike me. I can't blame her for it. Then voices rose from everywhere. What a terrible parent. That's really low. However, Tommy did not seem to want any pity. Everyone has their circumstances, so I'd ask you to not judge them here. Please, I beg you. When everything ended, my husband and I helped Tommy get into the car. Our car was modified so that Tommy's wheelchair could easily get in. Upon returning home, my sister-in-law and her husband were waiting for us. Tommy, you won the Pulitzer Prize? I'm so happy. Come live with us again. My sister-in-law suddenly changed her attitude. She probably thought that Tommy was going to make a lot of money. No, I'll keep living here. I'm not going back to that house. But I'm your real mother. My only parents are Sally and David. Then give us the prize money. No, this money's for my mom and dad, not you. It's for Sally. What? I'm the one who raised you all these years. Give it to me. No way. Despite her not being short on money, my sister-in-law has a keen nose for it. She's the type to latch onto anything that could quickly turn into cash. That's why she insisted on having the $15,000 from the Pulitzer Prize. But Tommy wasn't giving up either. I no longer think of you as parents. Even when I was young, you insulted me. I didn't speak ill of you at the press conference. But you often said things like you wish you hadn't given birth to me. You even said you wanted to abandon such a worthless son, didn't you? Do you have any idea how much that hurt? I'm the one who's at a loss for having given birth to someone like you. You should be the one apologizing. I did nothing wrong. How dare you forget the favor of raising you? Her husband also kept demanding for the money. It made me wonder how greedy they could be. It's shameful. Really vulgar. They flated their status as full-time employees and how they weren't short on money, yet they seemed foolish. So I decided to counterattack. You love money so much you're selling all kinds of stuff in those online marketplaces, aren't you? You're that desperate to make a profit? What? Look, you're selling a bunch of seashells, right? And it seems like you're also selling coral. You think that's okay? Huh? Everyone buys seashells to decorate their homes. No, that's not okay. Maybe taking a few seashells as a souvenir from a beach in Hawaii is okay, but certainly not coral. Even if you say it's not okay, they're beautiful and they're not alive, so what's the problem? It's not about that. Both seashells and coral are important in forming the beach. Even if the coral is dead, it's not okay to take them home. It's even written on Hawaii's official website. Maybe check out the fishing regulations of Hawaii. It'll show you it's not okay. And seems you might even have to pay a fine if it's deemed malicious. What? No way, I absolutely refuse. Well, since you're selling them on the online marketplaces, it's definitely malicious. So I'm going to report you. We're going inside the house now. Bye. No, don't. I totally will. You'll definitely get caught. I can't wait. And with that, we swiftly went inside our house. Immediately after, we contacted the police. Anyone might pick up a few seashells, but I saw it on the online marketplace. My sister-in-law was selling a huge amount of seashells and coral, and it was a ridiculously large amount. I thought she was a poacher or something. She might have thought it was okay to take coral as long as it wasn't alive, but ignorance can be scary. Of course, I also reported her on the online marketplace. While I realized 
the situation just yesterday, so I think it served as a perfect payback. Ever since then, my sister-in-law got involved with the police and ended up paying fines. I hope she realizes the gravity of her actions. She has done something so serious that she should reflect on her actions. Since then, my sister-in-law has stopped coming to our house. I wonder if she's scared that I might do something again. As far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't do anything unpleasant to her unless she does something to me. But I don't want to deal with my sister-in-law, so I'm thankful she's keeping her distance. I wish she would keep it this way forever. I, on the other hand, am taking care of Tommy while working from home. I'm also getting help from a caregiver, so I don't have to do everything on my own. Indeed, it's tough to care for him as he's bedridden, but I'm happy just to be able to be with him. I want Tommy to keep writing novels worry-free from now on. I hope that his novels will become even more well-known all over the world. Our kids have also become huge fans of Tommy's novels. They'll be coming back home soon, and I hope we can all spend a good time together as a family.